Night Shifters on Reddit, what's your scariest story? I work nights as a zookeeper. Sometimes we have to check on the gorillas in their indoor holding. You walk down a dark hallway, maybe six feet from their enclosure. All you have is a flashlight and it's sometime after midnight. Your goal is to check on each gorilla to make sure they are okay. The gorilla's goal is to scare the ever-loving shit out of you. It's a game for them to get you to scream. They love hiding behind walls, sneaking up on you, and then bellowing as loud as they can right next to you. It's a fun game for them. Haunted houses have nothing on gorilla jump scares. Working in a restaurant at 2.30 am some dude shows up and is just watching us through the front window, seemed drunk at first, ignored him for a few minutes, turned back around and he had a huge fucking rock in his hands and lifts it above his head and slams it against the window shattering the outside layer. He then looks directly at us and says I'm gonna kill all of you. We dialed the police immediately and armed ourselves with kitchen knives. He wandered back to his car and sped off. The cops got there maybe 8 minutes later, seemed like 30 at the time, and couldn't find the guy. We were robbed at gunpoint a few nights later. I just walked out and never went back. I posted this somewhere else, but this is my story, I was an emergency dispatcher for the police department in my city, working overnights, when a woman called in to say her depressed husband had gone missing. She said he sometimes liked to go to a local, 1800s era, cemetery and just be alone. We sent two officers out to look for him, and they saw the door to the mausoleum cracked open. When they went in, they made their way through the very dark underground rooms and finally one of their flashlights caught the image of a figure. They thought it was the man just standing there, but it turned out that he had hanged himself from one of the pipes overhead, and was dead. The ceiling was so low to the ground that his feet were still on the floor. The officers hightailed it out and called back to say they had found him. This was late October in Maine. Very spooky. I used to work third shift security in a neighborhood near a university. We often encountered some weird stuff, but mostly we just dealt with drunk college brothers and the like. One night it's nearly 4 am so we're ending our shift and heading in when this old homeless looking man stops me and asks me to call an ambulance for him. I ask what's wrong and he's telling me he's having heart palpitations and suicidal ideation. I flag down a coworker who informs our boss and calls for the ambulance. I sit down next to the guy as he's laying on the sidewalk and let him talk to me. At first he's saying what you'd expect from someone who wants to commit suicide then it gets dark as hell. He starts telling me about a woman he stabbed because he asked her for $20 but she only gave him a few bucks so he murdered her. Okay, pretty creepy, but then it gets worse. He just starts going on about how he's raped people and committed arson and other horrifying stuff and I'm sitting almost alone with him while my coworker is several buildings down on the phone with dispatch. He starts telling me about how his mother used to have sex with her father and brother and that he saw that? and about how he's a crackhead. When the ambulance arrived he started cussing and yelling but at least I was free to go at that point. I understand it was probably at least partially the ramblings of a mentally ill crackhead but it was still unnerving. It's not every day a stranger confesses to you about murder and rapes he's committed. Also, I'm a young woman so I would occasionally get the super fucking creepy guys who would try to corner me on dark roads or follow me around. So that would get pretty terrifying. I used to be a bouncer at several different locations in the Toronto downtown area. I enjoyed working on the patio when I could despite not being a smoker because talking to people made time go by faster and hey, easier to get phone numbers. There was this one place I worked at that always had crazy shit happen. The patio was also a weak chain link fence with some tarp thrown over it. The club was cheap so the fence didn't cover the entire area so I had to be watchful of people trying to sneak in. One night, I felt lazy so I stood in the opening with my back to the street. I was talking to some people trying to kill the time. I felt some guy stand behind, coming in from the street. This wasn't too unusual, some people get turned away and when they see me, try to bribe their way through the patio entrance. I was having none of it so I puffed myself up, determined to ignore him until he gave up on me noticing him. After about 10 minutes of this, I started getting a bit creepied out cause the guy was just standing behind me without saying or doing anything. I turned around to tell him to fuck off, but stopped mid-sentence. This guy was a bit taller than me, I'm 6 feet 2 inches, kinda lanky, very well dressed. 
he was also covered from head to toe in blood. Like completely drenched. I thought he'd been in an accident so I dropped my tough guy act and starting asking him if he was okay, needed an ambulance, etc. He calmly responded, nah he's good. He just wants to find his brothers. I was like you mm, are you sure your brothers are here? He insists that they are here as they told him they'd be in X city, not anywhere near Toronto where the club is located. After his complete obliviousness to what city he's in, the fact that he's soaked in blood, and his intense stare, dude wasn't blinking, I called my boss up. When my boss appeared, I gave a quick rundown of what happened. He talked to the guy very briefly, then told him he'd assist. He went and got some patrolling cops. When the cops appeared, one of them lightly touched the bloody guy on the shoulder. That's when he started screaming incoherently and tried slashing at him with a small knife that had been concealed in his pocket. The cops, my boss, and I subdued the guy until he could be cuffed and placed inside a cop car. The guy was screaming loudly and struggling to hulk out of the cuffs, as the cuffs cut deeply into his wrists, the entire time. I worked for four years as a chef in a nursing home. I typically left by 8 every night but I would occasionally stay over and help the third shift janitors clean and lock up the kitchen. I was leaving one night close to 11 or midnight-ish when the front desk lady asked me to run into the tunnel and grab a few items from the locked housing unit. My building was split into two side-by-side -side buildings connected by a tunnel underground that we would transport bodies of the deceased so other residents didn't see them. This prevented panic attacks for our elderly patients. The tunnel had a few storage units down there so it wasn't uncommon to need to get stuck. To get into my end of the tunnel you had to use a locked stairwell or elevator with a passcode. So I get to the tunnel and for some reason all of the lights are out except the red glowing emergency exit signs. Alright no biggie. I turned the corner from the elevator to head up the tunnel and retrieve the items Margie needed when I see a tall black figure just swaying side to side. I approached it just in time for it to shriek at the top of its lungs, effectively prompting everything in my bowels to make a sudden vacation in my pants. She was illuminated only by the red exit signs in a dingy cement tunnel. She screamed, I screamed, she screamed louder, Ronnie the poor janitor from further in the tunnel screamed and repeat. She turned out not to be a demon spawn ready to reap my soul, but a memory patient that woke up in the night and wandered off in a daze. How she ended up in the tunnel I never figured out but after calming her down I was able to walk her back to her room and get her settled. The fucking attending nurse didn't even know she was missing and I don't know how long she was down there. I was careful about that tunnel for a long time after that though. I used to work for a sub shop as a delivery driver. Weirdest thing was the Montana cowboy. I'm located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so we have a diverse crowd of homeless. One night around 1 a.m. a cowboy-looking dude walks into the shop. He seems just off on something. Can't form any sentences whatsoever. All I could get out of him was his name, Ben. Ben seemed like he was very drunk, smelled like it too, and had something else in his system. He kept kind of saying the same gurgled mess over and over. No idea what he was saying. Me and the manager I was working with are pretty chill guys, so we offered him some soup and a sandwich for free. He was so happy and thankful, I think. While he's eating, I went out on a delivery and stopped the car in an apartment. As I'm walking up, a cowboy walks out. Not the same cowboy but a different one. I said hello or whatever, but he responded with the gurgled mess the guy in the shop said to me. Like same cadence and tone, everything. Even kinda looked like him. I thought that was weird. So I got back to the shop and cowboy is still there. He's eating and saying nonsense. My manager found out he was from Montana. So I go on another delivery. Walk up to the apartment building, but wait a fucking second, there's a ma fricker with a ma damn cowboy hat sitting on the stoop and asked me for a dollar. I told him all the cash I have is for my work. He said a gurgled mess like the last two guys and I left. Now here's a damn kicker. I go back to the shop and Ben is gone. So I go on my last delivery around 3 AM and pull up to a house. It's lit up inside and I can see people are moving around with the shadows on the window. I knock on the door, who answers? Da ang Ben. And who's in the dang house with him? The other two dang cowboys. Ben says, sup hands me a $100 bill and slams the door. I was dumbfounded. When I was a young teenager, 
I had a commercial cleaning gig with my parents as the night shift guys. You know. The ones who come into your friendly neighborhood chilies after the other guys close and really clean the place, kitchen, bathrooms, and all. The restaurant was located in a fairly busy area of town in a mini strip mall so we weren't really concerned about security since there was always a patrolling night guard riding around the strip's parking lot to make sure that there was no trouble. Well, this particular night, it was just myself and my mother cleaning one of our nightly buildings by ourselves while my pop and sister were doing the other one across town. Everything was going smoothly until my mum realized she left our new box of Tide, we used it for the kitchen floors, outside in the truck. Me being unfazed by the aspect of being alone outside at 1 am in the morning chose to go get it and right when I was locking the door to the truck and inching my way back inside, I noticed a guy standing across the parking lot just staring at me. He wasn't moving or anything like that, just staring. It was creepy as hell, so I merely walked back inside and made sure that the door was locked before continuing to do my business. When I moved out of the kitchen into the front dining area to begin mopping, that's when I noticed that creeper dude was now standing beneath the front door awning outside, staring in the glass, looking at me. Dude practically screamed homeless with his disheveled clothes, long, stringy hair and thick, wild beard but honestly it was his eyes that really freaked me out. I can only describe them as utterly soulless. Beginning to get a bit freaked out, but not wanting to be rude, I gave him a quick glance before going back to do my work but before I could really do it, he started slowly and almost rhythmically pounding on the glass with his fists, still staring intently at me. At that point, I was pretty much done with trying to be patient with him and promptly yelled at him to piss off. My mum heard me yelling from the kitchen and came out to see just what all of the commotion was and I told her while pointing at the man. The moment that I did though, I saw my mum blanch and then slowly begin to back away. She grabbed my wrist and urged me to do the same but wouldn't let me turn around to see what the hell was up. We reached the back stock room of the restaurant and stayed there while mum called the strip security guard to let him know what was up. Later that evening after the security guard came and checked the place, he said there was no sign of the guy, but there, at the front door of the restaurant, he found a discarded straight razor laying in the middle of the pavement and another in the bushes at the place that he had been pounding on the glass. My mum said that when I had called her over and looked away, he had grinned at her and I both and held up the knife to tap it against the glass. We no longer work nights but still, whenever we do get the occasional call for a deep clean, I always have my own weapons with me just in case. I work at an industrial copper mine in British Columbia, Canada. The mine water gets filtered through a tailings process and ponds spread out through the woods. We work from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and with travel to and from work included, the workday is about 15 hours long. A typical work tour is five nights long, and by the end of it you are pretty tired. Driving through the forest at night, you have to get out of your truck when you get to a pump house. On several occasions I can hear the screaming of animals, various birds, coyotes, wild cats, bears, etc., and never really understand the origin of the sound. You can shine a flashlight at the woods, but it's not uncommon to find blinking reflective eyes, so it's almost better not to. You just end up creeping yourself out. One night I was at one of the pump houses in the dark, and I hear bushes rustling just feet from me, around the corner of the pump house door I just locked. I froze in place both out of fear, and uncertainty as to whether I should unlock the pump house or run back to my truck. The rustling got louder, and for some foolish reason I shined my flashlight at the noise and walked towards it. I saw the branches of the bushes explode forward as a giant brown monster popped out. It took a second to realize it was a moose. If you have ever seen a moose in person, you know they are huge. It just fucked off in another direction, but scared the crap out of me in the process. This happened a few months ago. I work at a grocery store overnights and everyone else who should have been there called out for one reason or another. I went out around 2 am to smoke and I saw someone on sitting on the bench. I didn't really think of anything of it, figured it was just a drunk who was wandering around the town since there's a few bars down the street. I sat down and started to smoke and look at my phone. The drunk guy screamed at me as I lit a smoke. Hey buddy do you mind? My dog doesn't like smoke. I looked around confused as fuck and didn't see a dog anywhere. I think your dog might have ran off somewhere, man. I don't see a dog. 
He stood up and opened up his jacket and he had a little pug in his jacket. I noticed he had a large kitchen knife sitting stuffed into his inside jacket pocket. He started to pet his dog and baby talk the dog with very slurred words. I put out my smoke and decided I'm not going to die for smoking next to a dog. He started singing Just Give Me a Reason by Pink and walking towards me as I was heading back in. Hurried back inside of the building. I did my basic military training at Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. Our barracks were old, dating to around the 1950s or 1960s. Every night, a number of recruits were assigned fire guard duty, which was essentially trying to stay awake for an hour and mopping the floor, or buffing it, until the next soldier came on duty. The fire guard post for my platoon was at one end of a long hallway, directly under a set of speakers suspended from the ceiling. Whenever the drill sergeants made an announcement, you'd hear them through the speakers. This is how they communicated Reveille, wake up, and other instructions where they had to talk to the whole building at once. Usually these were communicated in blistering shouts, rendered staticky and nearly unintelligible as they blared through the ancient sound system. One night, about halfway through basic, so sleep deprivation really hitting hard by this point, I was sitting in a chair under the speakers, trying to stay awake. The speakers crackled to life, and I immediately perked up. Unusual for an announcement this time of night, but it wasn't outside the realm of possibility. The voice was soft, barely above a whisper. A woman's voice, private, get everyone outside. Right now. The comm line remained open, a low hum hissing through. The voice again, right now, private. Everyone outside. Weird. Not that it was a woman's voice it was a co-ed basic training and we had a couple female drills. But for it to come across so softly was very strange. When the brown rounds used the intercom, it was at full, shouting voice. I headed down the length of the hall to where 2nd platoon had a fire guard on duty similarly situated. Asked him if he heard anything, got a negative response. I made a decision, I'd chalk it up to my imagination and tiredness, and not risk having the entire barracks furious at me for disturbing their sleep in error. If it was one of the drill sergeants messing with me, and I got in trouble for not waking everyone up, at least I'd be the only one getting smoked. Nothing happened the rest of the night, and I put it out of my mind until the very end of basic, when we had our three-day field training exercise. We made it through, and the drills started treating us like real humans, almost, again. As we completed the last day of the exercise, which was a near-live fire night march to attack scenario, we all gathered around the fire. The drills got to talking, then got to telling stories, then got to telling ghost stories about the base. My drill, Perita, a male, told the story of the first female drill sergeant on Fort Leonard Wood. Can't remember when it was, 70s, 80s, but it was decades ago. Apparently she faced a lot of pressure and harassment, as you can imagine. It was unrelenting and harsh, and apparently she couldn't take it. She'd hung herself from some exposed water pipes, using her belt. A few years later, they'd plastered over the exposed pipes. So they could mount speakers there. Was working the overnight shift at a small town gas station and walking out of the bathroom, I saw a guy looking in through the window. I informed him that the door was unlocked, he came in, asked for some alcohol, then went to the bathroom. When he returned, he asked me if I liked making money. I knew this was going to go to a place I didn't want it to go to, but nonetheless answered in the affirmative. He proceeds to basically offer me a role in a car smuggling ring and makes me give him a, fake, phone number. The entire conversation was tense. This dude wasn't fucking around. He also asked for directions to a town about 30 minutes away and I super cheerfully and clearly told him as I wanted nothing more than for him to be there and not here. About an hour later, the same car pulls into the lot and parks sideways by the door. At this point, I am internally freaking the fuck out. Oh my god, he called the number, found out I bullshitted him, and now I'm fucked. Much to my relief, his much less imposing friend walks in and again asks me for directions to the same town. 
I actually lead him outside and point out exactly what road he needs to turn down and give him full directions. The entire time, his scary ass friend is completely turned around in the passenger seat staring me down with a look on his face that I don't ever want to see again. TL, DR, guy invites me into car jacking ring, I give him fake phone number, he returns an hour later and tries to murder me with his eyes. It isn't a very vivid one, but is what I have. I work in a sleep lab, and I smoke. Before participants come into the lab I have to set up things, as the labs are used for other activities during the day, it's at a university. So I'm there, making beds, setting up the polysomnograph and whatnot alone. I take a break for a cigarette. It's about 10pm, normally fully dark. But it isn't. There's a bit of a weird orange glow in the sky. Strange smell on the air. No idea what it is, but work is work, I shrug and go inside. While I'm inside, I hear some weird noise from the outside world. Now, these are sleep labs. They are meant to be soundproofed. But some doors are open, and soundproofing isn't perfect. So I send some messages to my friends who know university vibes a bit better than I do. I'm not the 18 to 22 of that sort of scene. Don't hear anything for a while. Then get a message. There have been protests. They are letting off explosives at the university. The police are there but can't engage. I call participants, tell them not to come in. I find out apparently roads are blocked to and from the university. So, being a reasonable person, I turn off the lights and close all the doors, get in one of the beds and go to sleep. Roads out of the university were still lined with protesters when I left in the morning, but after about half an hour of convincing them that I was nice and they should let me leave, out all in one piece. Found out some of the explosives were about 200 meters from my lab. Good times. I was the control room supervisor at the nuclear plant I work at. 1 am on a Saturday, nothing is going on, we are bored out of our mind. Out of nowhere over 200 alarms come in all at once along with the room lights flickering. I immediately turn and look, usually flickering lights means we either had a large pump malfunction or a reactor shut down, but we usually don't get 200 alarms at the same time. The next 10 seconds felt like 5 minutes as I'm trying to assess the status of the unit. As I turn my head from left to right I see all my equipment is still functioning despite all sorts of system failure and trip alarms. When my head turns all the way right I'm looking at the reactor and see it is still critical, despite reactor trip alarms being in. My blood pressure immediately shoots up and I see the rest of the crew notice the same thing. Why the hell was the core still online? Everyone was just staring at the full core display and the red control rod out lights that were still lit. Reactor scram failures are a huge deal. They are extraordinarily rare, only one has occurred in the US commercial nuclear industry. We train for them around 40% of the time, because they require rapid actions to make the reactor safe. So when you are sitting here questioning why the reactor is still online, it really drives up the anxiety. Is this really happening, and if it is real, you have around 2 minutes to commence taking actions to reduce core subcooling to prevent core damage. The reactor control operator starts reaching for the reactor scram switch and turns his head to look at me and says my name. I can see it in his eyes, his heart has to be pounding hard too. Him and I have worked together long enough that I already know what he's thinking. He wants to make sure at least one other person agrees with him before he punches out the reactor, so that if he's wrong, it's not a unilateral decision. He also is really hoping someone will tell him he's crazy and he needs to sit back down. I finally took a long deep breath, my first since the alarms came in. That breath re-energized my brain and got everything thinking correctly. I took a few extra seconds to scan the panels just to be absolutely sure. I was concerned we had to scram the core. We had reactor trip indications which should have shut the reactor down, but it was still online. But between that deep breath and those few extra seconds I saw it as clear as day on one of my control boards, one of our power lines went down. I look up at the generator information screen and see that grid voltage just spiked off scale high then low and stabilized. I look back down and see some power grid circuit breakers tripped. The rest of the plant was stable, water level stable, power level stable, coolant flow and pressure stable. 
Right at that time the secondary reactor operator starts pointing at the power grid panel too. Everything made sense now. I raise my hand and say update, power line XXXX has dropped, we've had an electrical system perturbation, the unit remains online and stable. Everyone walk down your boards to verify system status and report back when you are complete. Reactor trip criteria was not met. Entering loss of power off normal. End of update. The reactor controls operator turns his head and sees the same thing I did, a power line went down. He nods his head, leans away from the mode switch, takes his own deep breath, presses the alarm silence button, and sits down. Just as fast as it started, I see everyone's anxiety level rapidly drop and we start clearing the alarms. I call up the power grid and they already had someone on their way to us. Apparently a vehicle struck a telephone pole and caused almost a mile of power line to go down pretty close to the plant. The field it was in was on fire as a result. It was pretty impressive. We've had issues in the past where a power grid perturbation from a lightning strike causes a few spurious alarms, but we've never had that many come in at once. Because the perturbation was that close to the plant, it caused a deeper perturbation and most of our alarm system basically rebooted, it's a solid state system so it can do that, causing all the false alarms. More than anything I felt our training and teamwork kick in. Using diverse indications to validate the condition, getting back up from the team, and taking a few seconds to stay level-headed. Our fundamentals kicked in and we made the right decision. Even though for about 15 seconds I almost needed a change of pants. I was working for my friend's dad one night helping him renovate this old abandoned building that was about to be purchased. It was around 3 am and we were pretty hungry so he asked if I would stay and finish up this one room while he went and got the food, his treat. I agreed and what seems like an hour had passed and I haven't heard from him. I decide to give him a call so as I'm going into the other room to grab my phone I hear rustling around and stuff start to fall over. I yell down the hallway seeing if it was my friend's dad. I yell once or twice get no reply as I'm starting to walk to investigate I hear this strange cry like our animal is being attacked and I see the light at the end of the hallway come on then go off then the next on then off, on then off getting closer and closer to me I start to backpedal not knowing what is going on and I trip over my own feet next thing I know the light above me turns on and it's my friend's great Dane. My friend's dad did get back turned on the motion sensor lights by mistake and brought the dog. He didn't answer me due to the fact he had food in his mouth. doing an overnight at a halfway house where I worked in college. Me and a colleague were in the office just BSing, when we see on the security camera someone walking through the alley. Absconce and people taking off is pretty common, so thought it was a resident taking off in the middle of the night. I tell her to stay in the office as I go out to the side door that leads to the alley the dude was coming. Well there's one camera facing down on way, and the other camera in the opposite type direction. When I get outside, no one is there. I radio back to the girl and she's telling me he has to be, she was watching him walk from one camera, and didn't see him in the next, so thought he was under our cameras or something. There's nothing in the alley besides a few telephone poles, with buildings on each side. I lit a cigarette and tried listening, but nothing. There's no where he could have been. We watched cameras again and sure as shit, everything is current of what we saw. We did a quick resident check and everyone was accounted for, so I don't know who this mystery guy was or where the hell he went. Used to work evenings at a movie theater until late in the night. Usually would get off at 11 but some late night movies wouldn't end till 1 or 2 in the morning so there were always cars in the parking lot but a part of it would be open and illuminated by several street lights so it'd be easy to see someone standing in that area. One night I got off work and was sitting on the steps to the theater looking off into the empty parking lot waiting for a relative to pick me up. We were texting back and forth and he told me to meet him at a nearby restaurant as it'd be easier to leave its driveway than the movie theater, different traffic. I got up and began walking. Part of the way over to the edge of the parking lot, I heard like some sort of ruffling or scraping noise. It just sounded simply like a shoe scraping along some gravel. I think it's just someone getting out of their car but I never saw anyone pull up and I had been out there for some time. I turned around to see if I could help the person getting out, considering I was still in uniform. I figured it could be someone asking me to tell them the time of a movie ending and how much longer they needed. Spun around and it's some dude crouched among rows of cars. As soon as I turned around he started quickly walking toward me all hunkered down. 
Never sprinted so fast in my life. Didn't recognize them or know their intentions so I wasn't taking any chances. Not really scary but disturbing. I worked night shifts with a serial killer. She is a nurse and had killed eight people since 2007. She was convicted two months after my last shift with her. She got fired for stealing narcotics. Edit to add details. I worked for a private home care company that was outsourced to long-term care homes. I worked with Elizabeth at Telfer Place. She was convicted of assaulting a resident there on one of the shifts I didn't work with her. She had a lot of cooped up anger towards residents and would pick them based on the aggression or how manageable they were. The lady she assaulted at Telfer was a hitter and screamed bloody murder if you tried to provide any care. She used insulin as a weapon because it's a silent killer if given in large doses and fairly hard to detect if the resident already has other health problems. She was a really weird lady, and pretty useless as a care provider since she wouldn't do any heavy lifting such as rolling a 300 pounds bed ridden resident over to wash them. I absolutely hate working with her because of that. Most shifts I worked with her it was just the two of us since it's nights and the residents at Telfer are supposed to be independent. When we worked together she just followed me around and talked. I really didn't listen to her which I kinda regret since it would have provided more insight into the person she was. She talked about inbreeding animals quite a bit which was strange, I wish I had more info on her but that's my experience working with her. Technically I was more of an early morning worker instead of night but, I was working for a grocery chain that is very large in Florida decorating the cakes and this one happened to be in a very nice area that had a lot of homeless people because it was just on the outskirts of downtown. This particular location had very limited parking and employees were encouraged to park across the street, very well light across the street and well lit through our customer parking lot, or park behind the building which backs up to a small road. The back of the building was not well lit due to the amount of trees. But if you're from the south, especially Florida then you know shaded parking is prime parking, so I parked on the backside. This particular morning I exited my vehicle like normal and proceeded to check my phone as I was walking towards the corner, this corner is another poorly lit side of the building before the entrance, and then I hear a car door opening and shouting. I turned around and see my produce manager screaming at some man. Apparently when I parked there were some men waiting in the bushes about 35 feet away from where I had parked and when I got out they stealthily moved towards me ready to attack. My produce manager was sitting in his car and when he saw them sneaking behind me got out and yelled at them and scared them off. He called the cops but they were long gone by the time they arrived. I used to be a night shifter but this scared the shit out of me, so I guess I'll tell it. Used to work for big name brand convenience store. I was fairly new to the night shift and the store. A lot of the people who had been there a while started telling me the store was haunted. Of course I didn't believe them. One story where one of the day crew refuses to go into the cooler because a ghostly woman screamed at him. Or the slushy machine would stop working randomly. Stuff like that. It's almost midnight, time to lock up the beer case. My co-worker slash assistant manager was outside smoking, I was the only person in the store, no employees, or nothing. The case's keyhole was at the top, it was pretty old and was difficult to lock sometimes. I'm reaching up to it, I'm short, and I think I see something out of the corner of my eye. There are other windows behind me, a few shopping rows back, but no one is outside, and no one is in the rows. I think, I'm just imagining things, probably a moth or something, it's midsummer, we get June bugs and moths, lots of them. So I go back to the cooler and look up. Right in the mirror, plain as day, a man, about 5 feet 9 inches to 6 feet 0 inches, wearing a plaid shirt, a grey wife beater, short, bowl cut hair standing literally one row behind me. I twist around, no one is there. I check rows, I even go outside and around the building, it's just me and my boss. I have no idea what I saw, but it was legit the scariest, creepiest thing to ever happen to me. Ghost or whatever, it was damn near insanity. Not me but my colleague. We were having a discussion inside the training room when he decided to go out and get some coffee. About a minute later, he barges back into the training room, looking all pale. To describe him, he's a tall guy with a strong build. We asked him what was wrong. He said he was passing by training room 4 when he decided to take a peek because the door was open and the lights were off, only the computers were on. He saw someone sitting in one of the stations, with her back facing him. He looked away for a second and when he looked at the training room again, she was gone. 
Can I mention that we were the only people there that shift? Additional, one of the security guards told us that that floor specifically was haunted. Sometimes he would hear keyboards clicking and lights flickering for no reason. And children laughing faintly near the fire exit. All of the night shift maintenance people and security guards have confirmed that the lot our building was built used to be a funeral home. I worked nights at a group home for girls aged 15 to 21 who were in foster care or house arrest but homeless. I was only 22 to 23 at the time, the whole thing was terrible all around. There was a main form with younger residents and residents 18 to 21 were in a separate dorm on the campus. Anyways, I go out to do building checks around midnight. I smell bug spray has just been sprayed so I run back inside my office. I told my supervisor why I wasn't doing the checks and she's like, why are you worried about smelling bug spray? Well, because people put bug spray on when they plan to be outside for a while. And it's an illegal item at the group home, so I thought it was a trespasser. Sure enough it was. A porn filming bus came to the campus to make videos with the girls. We saw them sneaking out and saw men coming and going from the other dorm. Called the police who took care of the whole thing while we were safely locked in our office. The scariest part, the girls were only paid $100 for the job. Made me so terribly sad for them. My first post ever? Yay me. Okay, so I worked nights at a maintenance company for many years. And we had one account slash contract with a massive insane asylum that had been empty for, I wanna say, AT at least 30 years plus slash. This place was huge, like over 20 buildings that were 3 to 5 stories tall. Very creepy, still had old wheelchairs covered in cobwebs in them, beds with restraints etc, you get the picture. Anyway they had recently began renovating them one building at a time, but over half were still untouched. Also there was a series of underground tunnels that connected all, or at least most, of the buildings together. Well one night in September slash October I was working alone in one building that was partially renovated, did I mention I was alone? Usually I'm pretty fearless, and most of that night I was cool. Until about 4 hours into it I started hearing creepy noises. Creaking wood, and this moaning, I'll never forget the moaning. At first I though I was imagining it, but quite quickly I realized to my horror, that I actually was hearing this, it was real. And it sounded like it was coming from the floor below me. So I grabbed a hold of the broom handle I was using, knowing damn well it would be useless against the forces of evil that awaited me, and I slowly headed toward the direction of the sounds. I was shitting bricks, but I had to go that way regardless because it was the only way out. I get down to the lower floor, and it's getting louder and less muffled sounding. As I get closer, I stop perfectly still and quiet for a moment to try and pinpoint where it's coming from. Well this floor was semi-renovated and I was near a small area of cubicles or desks, I can't remember exactly, and some fucking festive asshat had put a Halloween screensaver on his computer in the cubicle. So the damn thing was playing these well-orchestrated creepy noises while in Reese mode or whatever. I was a perfect mix of relieved and pissed. I never worked alone in that place again. This story is graphic and still gives me nightmares to this day. I worked in an assisted living home overnight, 11P7A, a normal night is me and one other worker doing laundry, answering call bells when people need help with the bathroom and getting people up for the morning shift. One night I was folding laundry watching TV and a call bell goes off in a room I've never had a call for, implying this woman is almost completely independent, most residents I don't interact with, I quickly get up and start making my way down the long halls of the building. This particular resident is on the top floor at the end of the hall so I needed to make haste to get to the staircase and go up a floor. I make it about halfway down the hall before I hear screams of horror. They were so loud I came to a stop. Some residents aren't the most mentally stable, what could produce the noise I just heard? I snap out of it and start running to the stairs to get upstairs. On the staircase I hear another scream. Louder, more desperate. I rip open the hall door and see handprints, bloody smeared handprints stretching down the hall. I start screaming down the stairs for my co-worker to call the police immediately. I cautiously make my way down the hall. At this point I'm convinced this one resident has finally snapped and stabbed someone. I get to the room where the call bell is and see a small pool of blood at the base of the door and drags into the room. I open the door and find an elderly woman standing over another woman in her bed. The standing woman is covered in blood, mostly on her face and her dress and she's holding something. I knew this resident, she is sane and usually kind to me. I ask her what's in her hand and she looks at me, holding her eye. I slowly look at her face and it's missing, her eye is missing. 
I asked her what happened and she said it just popped out. I brought her to the closest chair and sat her down while my co-worker relocated the resident who lived in that room. The paramedics and police arrived insanely fast and took over. I waited in the lobby and they told me she had an undocumented prosthetic eye and had an infection had ruptured and forced her eye out while she was sleeping. Retired police officer here. I was sitting deep in the woods in my patrol car one night when an awful sound came over my radio. I typed into my cat asking dispatch what that was. They responded that there had been no transmission. I'm literally 7 miles down a dirt road, in the middle of nowhere, with no one, that I know of, around for many many miles, and I'm supposed to go check that a back gate to a farm is locked. It's pitch black, not even stars. Moments later, the same eerie sound came through my car. Sounded like a moaning female. It was definitely over my car's police radio. The radio button even lit up the way it does when you receive a transmission. Seconds later, my supervisor came over asking for backup on a traffic stop, far far away from me, and it was clear that the quality of the eerie transmission and the one from him were not at all the same. I tried to call into dispatch on my next Dell, but couldn't get any signal. I was so creeped out, I turned around on the very narrow dirt road and hauled ass out of there, deep in the woods, on this very narrow dirt road, likely doing 90 miles per hour with all my lights on, and high beams, and my searchlight, just praying I wouldn't hit any animals because I was scared to death. Honest to God, both times it sounded like a dying woman was in my car, yet the transmission was crackling and definitely came through my police radio. I never returned to that area without other officers in tow, and when I finally discussed what happened with the only co-worker I trusted not to think I was insane, he turned white as a ghost, shut his office door and told me that the exact same thing had happened to him years prior, but that he had called into dispatch the three times it happened in that hour, and that they had all laughed at him repeatedly, thinking he was either crazy or joking. He actually pulled the transmission logs from that night, and found that no transmissions came through during the time he was out in the woods except for two actual transmissions between officers in town that he had heard and recalled. The three times, he heard what sounded like the painful moaning of a dying woman, he said that they sounded very close or as if they were inside his car but that his dash lit up as if he were getting a transmission from the radio. I asked him what the hell he did. And he said he pulled his shotgun out of the rack, dropped it on the passenger seat, pulled his handgun out of his holster, and basically drove the exact same way I did until he got back to civilization, a firehouse out on the main road you turn off of to get into that area. The only thing either of us could figure is that there are high tension lines that run through those woods and maybe it was some kind of disturbance. You can't, or at least couldn't back then, get cell phone or radio transmission clearly, normally if you went out that way for some kind of call, the fire department or another officer went with because there was no way to call for backup or help out there. To this day, that was one of the scariest things to ever happen to me, and I've been face to face with a gunman while I was hiding and he was not. I've faced multiple armed suspects, been on traffic stops gone wrong, worked traffic fatalities where the dead ended up thrown into the woods in the middle of the night and I had to babysit bodies or body parts. All of that was nothing compared to that night, alone in the woods with something. And I swear on my life this was a true story. I worked in Charlotte County, Florida as a patrol deputy. I could even post a location on a map as to where it happened. You couldn't pay me enough to go there at night alone, ever. Oh man, I've worked for the city of LA for the last six months. Our schedule is from midnight to 1 p.m. So far I've had many scary slash weird encounters with all sorts of people. Drug addicts, drug dealers, pimps, gang members, you name it I've probably seen it. I would say so far the scariest thing for me has been working in Skid Row. I worked with a crew of 4 to 7 people putting in lanes for brand new paved streets. I had a woman come running up to me who was stabbed 4 times, bleeding all over the place with needles sticking out of her arm. We've been shot at in San Pedro. Bottles thrown at us from the tops of buildings. It actually broke the driver's side glass, scary shit dead people. Toaster baths in parks. People getting hit by cars. As a city employee we take an oath, 
sign a paper actually, to help the citizens of LA. So if we see or encounter an accident or someone who needs legitimate help we have to do our best to get them the services they need. Working July 4th was crazy. You didn't know if they were actual gunshots or not. We were working by the old LA zoo and man, at 2 am it is incredibly eerie. Well we came across a man who was game ended and thrown out of a car. There are just so many interesting stories in such a small amount of time. My work has me walking slash running around the whole plant all shift, we usually cover around 12 to 16 kilometers on a good day. Combine this with Ontario's minus 30 Celsius winters and a deadly crosswind caused by open shipping doors makes for a pretty rough shift. I was close to death four hours into my shift so my co-worker told me she'd cover me while I went and took a quick nap in my car. I parked in the cat assembly plant's parking lot across the street from ours so the supervisor couldn't see me, like my co-worker told me too. No more than 15 minutes into my 3 a.m. nap I was startled awake by someone tapping on my window. Looking around the parking lot was deserted. Whoever woke me must have either ran away in the seconds it took me to open my eyes or evaporated. I decided to head back to work and told my co-worker about what happened. Her response, oh yeah, that happens all the time with everyone working night shift, we don't know who or what it is I haven't taken a parking lot nap since. Working night shift at a memory care unit, like a nursing home for people with dementia. The nurse's desk is in the center of the unit and north and south there are two 50-yard hallways with residence rooms lining them. At night things are slow so the lights are shut off down the hallways and put on motion sensors so if a resident wakes up and comes out of their room one of the hallway lights will pop on. There are five large fluorescent lights that go down the corridor ceiling. Sitting at the desk minding my own business when all of a sudden at the end of the south hall the farthest light pops on. I wait for a resident to come out of their room but nothing for a few seconds until the next closest light blinks on. Weirded out a bit I waited and the third light pops on, as if someone were walking towards me. Then the fourth light blinks on. Then the fifth light closest to the desk and my whole body is seized with terror. And then, boom, they all click off. To this day I have never been more scared shitless in my entire life. Something was moving slowly down the hallway but I couldn't see it but the sensors could. I will never forget the feeling. Just plain horror. I had worked at a hotel in sketchy area. I would work the late afternoon slash night shifts. During the weekends we would get people who would rent out a room just for the sake of using our pool. The winter time we were more busy than usual because if you live in Michigan or in any Midwest state for that matter you find out that winter can become very boring and depressing. I was working the front desk by myself which is a huge no-no in the hotel industry but the owners were cheap and didn't feel like paying for two people to work the same shift. So at nights it would get weird. We would have a lot of men come in with hookers and then families who would come to utilize our pool and hot tub. We had a rule that if you had stayed in the room for over two hours that you were charged for the room and you wouldn't get a refund. Well one night I had a bunch of families come in to use the pool. I ended up having to close the pool area down early this night because a kid had threw up in the pool which meant it would take a whole 24 hours before we could clean it all out and get it up and running again. I had a few families that were irritated by this since this was their main reason to rent out a room but when I explained what happened they were cool with it and just stayed in their rooms. I unfortunately though had one lady who was not okay with this. She came downstairs to the front desk and began cussing me out. She was upset because I had to close down the pool area that was filled with vomit and she wanted a refund for her room because she wanted to leave and go somewhere else. I explained to her in a calm matter that she wasn't able to get a refund for her room considering it had been over the two hour mark. Which made her even more furious and get louder. I tried calling my manager but he was too busy getting a lap dance at a strip club to seem to care. I wish I was kidding about that. So I just kept trying to talk to her in a calm and professional manner and explain to her that if she calls the hotel tomorrow and speaks to my manager that maybe they could work something out. She wasn't having it with that explanation either. I think the fact that I kept repeating myself in a calm tone would get her more upset. She then began telling me how she is going to leave with her kids and come back with her baby daddy and they were going to kill my tiny white girl ass. At this point I am now scared because she looked and sounded like a woman that kept her word. So I decided to call the cops. 
She took off before the cops showed up and I thought that was the end of her. Well before the cops appeared she called me and said I'm in the parking lot with my baby daddy and we are waiting for your shift to end because when it does you're dead. Finally the cops showed up and took a statement from me. They said there wasn't much they could do. They looked around the parking lot for her and this man she said she was with but they couldn't seem to find her. I ended up having to have one of the cops follow me to my car and then follow me home. I then had quit the next day. More sad than scary, but I used to work for Hostess pre-bankruptcy. Part-timers, even though we almost never actually worked part-time hours 40 plus, mostly worked shifts for people on vacation. I was covering the shift on someone the night crew and it was probably early hours of the AM, 1 to 3 AM. Our loading dock was open, no gates, garage doors that were never shut. We had three semi trucks lined up next to each other with side doors open and a metal plate that would link them together so you could load the racks of bread onto any of them. I'm pushing a rack back to the very back trailer and this guy just approaches me out of nowhere. Starts just asking me how my day is going and everything. I'm a little weirded about, but whatever. I talk to the guy for a minute and he just breaks down in tears, starts calling me daddy and how sorry he is. Gets to the point where I can't even understand him because he is crying so much. I had no idea what to do or say. I tell him multiple times that I'm not his dad and that he needs to go. He starts climbing into one of the trucks and I freak out. I booked it back into the bakery, tell the manager the situation. He runs out into the trucks and the guy is just gone. Can't see him down any of the streets, figured he just booked it when I ran into bakery. Bonus short story, another night a dude got his arm jammed in the donut wrapper. You know the little donuts that come powdered, crumb, or glazed in a six pack. Under any circumstance you should never attempt to fix a donut that's about to go in. Stuck his hand in, tore a ton of skin off his forearm. I was living in Northern California with what I grew to understand later was in a domestic abuse situation. I had ran away after having a physical altercation with my boyfriend and went to the beach, where I often went to contemplate. It was a particularly weird day. The wind was whipping. It was cold, there was an overcast sky. The beach was totally empty and I remember getting a very eerie feeling as I sat alone, looking out into the endless ocean. I finally looked behind me to see a figure perfectly perched on top of a fence pole. To look at it did not make sense. It was clearly a person wearing black pants and a hooded sweatshirt. The body was small, I thought female. The hood was cloaked and they were balancing on this pole, hugging their knees and their face was looking down into their lap. It did not look possible and almost defied physics. I started to get a panic feeling so I immediately grabbed my keys out of my pocket and marched towards my car. Of course the path to my car was near this figure. I darted as quickly as I could by her, when I got near she lifted her head up and me and with white eyes. No pigment at all. That is forever burned in my mind. She said what the fuck are you looking at with serious hatred towards me. I ran to the car and drove out of there like a bat out of hell. Could have been a crackhead but I always felt like I had seen a demon that day. Or at least it was the manifestation of one of the darkest points in my life. I look at it as a warning that I heeded and was a turning point in my life. I left that situation shortly after that experience and I truly believe I would have been dead if I didn't get out when I did. Reposting this but I worked all around the south cleaning grill hoods at Nug Height and here is good story. Broke down one night, pulled into a gas station and called our tow truck guy who always comes and gets us regardless. This time when we told him where we were he got rather serious and stated that he would only come once it is daylight outside and to call the cops and get the fuck out of their ASAP. We called our boss who was drunk, his B-day, so we had to wait for his buddy to come. The next three HRS were very interesting. We had $2,000 plus worth of equipment in back of the truck so my brother and I posted up so on one took us by surprise. The whole night people were coming up asking if we were cops, then for money, afterwards some went to the gas station's bathroom and got high. Someone asked to polish our completely rusted out truck with no paint on it clamming he was just Rob pointed to his head as if he was injured or something and needing $20. Saw a young kid get dropped off with a very full backpack, 3 a.m., who disappeared into the apartments behind us only to emerge two hours later with a visibly empty backpack. 
some random lady in a nurse's outfit pulled up at 4 a.m. with a baby in the care asking you white boys needed pills. Some crackhead dude kept coming and going and each time would sing a bluegrass songs to us then ask for ice cubes or something. There was a party at the hotel across the street and some dude got his ass beat, later the party came to the gas station to get food and shit and surprisingly there was a cop in uniform parting with them, around 6 a.m. the boss's friend showed up, we loaded his truck and left. By the time the tow truck got there, 8 a.m., the tires were gone. Not as scary as some of these stories, but I worked at a gas station overnights for a while. A big ass man, I'm talking big walks in and goes straight to the cooler for beer. Signals for these two girls to walk in and help. They come in and I realize this guy's a pimp and these are his two girls. They each grab two cases of the biggest packs of beer and walk up to me. As they're walking up the two girls walk out and the guy walks up to me and says, we won't be paying your store for these, and lifts his shirt a bit to show a gun. At the time I was sporting a big ankle monitor, awaiting trial for something I didn't do, and proved that I didn't yay. I stepped back and pointed to it and said, I really don't care. He looked smiled and put $200 in a sack of weed on the counter and told me to pocket it. I was scared shitless until he put the money down. He came in almost every night from then on and would give me bud and money for the beer. He refused to pay the store and would never tell me why. He also told me he had seen me before grabbing a quick toke out in the car almost every morning and tried to convince me to be one of his girls but I never took him up on that. Scary looking dude I can't even begin to explain. After a month, he stopped coming in. I watch security cameras for a transport company in Detroit. It was roughly 2 a.m. I'm watching the cameras and notice a woman in a nightgown standing, also barefoot, at the end of the driveway, the facility is fenced and gated. I kept an eye on her, and she hovered there for about 5 minutes, not really moving, just swaying back and forth. There weren't too many people working that late, but I let everyone at the facility know there was a woman standing outside of the gate. One driver decided that he didn't care, he needed to hit the road. When he exited the gate, the woman walked in front of the truck, blocking him. I immediately phoned the police. He blared his horn. She then rushed to the side of the truck and attempted to open his door aggressively. He sped away, leaving her standing there. She continued to stand there, in one place, not really moving for maybe 10 minutes. She eventually walked away, never to be seen by us again. The police never showed up. I was taking a body to the morgue with a tech one night. People had used all the gurneys inside the cooler that were closest to the door and left the empty ones on the back row. I pulled a body out so that I could get at the back row to get an empty one out. Once the body was out of the way, I went into the cooler to get my gurney. When I started pulling, it bumped another gurney that had a body on it. That body's hand fell out of the sheet. The tech screamed, pushed the body outside the cooler back in and slammed the door on me. I was stuck in the cooler with no light, surrounded by dead bodies. This was before the era of cell phones and the light switch for the cooler was outside the cooler. I had to rearrange the gurneys with the bodies on them by feel to make enough space to squeeze to the door and feel around for the handle to get out. Worked in law enforcement on a restricted government site. Took six months to get clearance. They checked everything including your neighbor's thoughts of you. I'm not gonna get specific with any names or procedures because I still have that Homeland Security clearance slash PIV card and yes my ass could get into trouble with too much specifics. They did all kinds of stuff including disease testing, chemical testing, bomb testing, radiation testing, weapons testing, weapons resistant testing, equip testing, and much more. There are more than several government agencies on this site hence the dip testing taking place. My job on the night in question was to clear the buildings after midnight to make sure nobody was on site, nobody was hurt and still on site with a medical issue etc. No major issues like fire, leaks etc. were happening, that nobody unauthorized gained access to sensitive government property. There's let's say over 70 different buildings on over a 200 acre property so the place is giant and goes back to the 50s. Straight out of a horror movie set. I was in a new to me part of the site that I hadn't been in yet after midnight. Each shift after hours split up the property. I go into this old ass small two-story building that's up on the property, in the woods on a hill by a government constructed pond that I won't go into what that's for but the reason is scary as shit. 
I'm all by myself down a dark road on a restricted government property. The gravel parking lot is empty so I know nobody should be in this building especially at this time. I go into the building and all the lights are off so I flick on the hallway lights and proceed through the building. I get to the end of the hallway and go into the last room and I can fucking see somebody is in there in the dark across the room so I get my hand on my pistol, slowly make my way to the light switch and the fucking thing doesn't work and makes a loud noise when it switches. At this point my mind is computing at a rate that would rival a supercomputer. Good thoughts and bad. I draw my flashlight and see an old big chair that's at an angle by the window and somebody is in the motherfucking chair. Shit myself twice when I saw a person. Somebody is sitting in the dark wearing a red flannel jacket in the summertime wearing a yellow construction hard hat looking out the window away from me into the pitch black night. Holy fuck brother cheese it's Christ ha. Huh? Now I'm thinking somebody broke in and there could be more and they could be behind me setting me up for an ambush. I back into the lit hallway and yell officer X, who is in the room. Is everything okay? No response. Again, respond, is everything okay? Nothing. I've got the light on the person and there's no movement at all. No acknowledgement of my presence. I have no backup to call and I'd have to leave the building to get the local police into the site causing me to lose direct sight of the person who could end up anywhere by the time I get back. Looks like I've got to go and handle this and watch it be the Mothman or some shit. I walk back into the room flashlight in one hand, gun in the other ready for some shit to pop out while my light is on the chair. I get to the chair and the hair is up on the back of my neck. Somebody is there in front of me. I shake the person and realize it's a life-sized mannequin that's used for testing and I feel stupid as fuck H.A. I told my fellow officers and it's always a laugh because every single officer has this happen their first time. They are always moving mannequins around for testing and you'll never know where they pop up, what clothing they'll be wearing or how many of them they'll be etc. Still I get scared by them and there's still a creep factor being around an exact detailed special replica of a person in the dark. I did a welfare check on a purple truck one night before the end of my shift. Me and my partner walked up to the driver's side of the vehicle and knocked on the window. After a brief second an older man leaned up from his seat looking rather disoriented. We explained to the man that we were just checking on him since we had gotten a report that there was a purple truck with the engine running but no visible occupants. We told the man he was more than welcome to sleep it off, we assumed he was inebriated, and take off whenever he felt he was okay to drive. The man shook his head not saying any words and faded back into his seat. Next night almost around the same time me and the same partner were making our rounds when we noticed the same purple truck but this time the engine was off. So we walk up the vehicle again same side as before and knocked on the window but this time no response. I pulled out my flashlight and began to examine the inside of the vehicle. That's when I noticed the man laying down across the bench seat in his pickup truck facing the back of the seats in the fetal position. I scanned the man's body starting from his feet up to his head and hands. Once my light shined on his hands I noticed they were grey and my immediate reaction was oh fuck this guy is dead. I took a step back looked at my partner and shared my reaction with him to which he replied not funny bro. I then went to the passenger side to take a look and see if I could see the man's face. I started at the man's hand which I could not see was stiff and grey and moved my light down towards his head. Once my light hit his head it was like lasagna. The man committed self end with a .45 through his mouth and out the top of his head. I saw that man's face everywhere for days after with the only thought that I was possibly the last person to speak with him. Not sure how scary this is to people reading it, but to me is was heart attack fuel. Okay so, I used to be a bartender, I'm no longer a bartender but I still work second shift. One night I was closing, and was too tired to drive home so I took a nap in my car. Next thing you know I get a knock on my window. Initially before I even opened my eyes, I assume it either had to be one of my co-workers checking in me slash being a jerk, or the police. Thinking it was the police I was about to just go for my wallet just to get the ID check part out of the way explained who I was get it out of the way so I could get back to sleep. But then I figured, if it's one of the staff I'm not going out of my way, this decision proved to save my life. It wasn't the local police, it was a sweet and armed US Marshal. So I rolled my window down, my car was idling because it was late fall and chilly outside, had the heat on so I didn't freeze to death, I was immediately fully awake. He wasn't being rude or overly aggressive. 
no more aggressive than you'd expect a hunting marshal to being when probing a potential suspect in the space of the last sighting of a fugitive, so I just answered his questions frankly. Now I'm ex-military and somewhat spatial paranoid. I've cut specific angles to nearby lights for the express purpose of noticing shadows while I'm in my car in a parking lot at night in case some scumbag decides to jump in and rob me or something. So when I noticed a very small shadow slide across the right side of my end panel and it immediately dart below the horizon, where he wouldn't cast a visible shadow anymore, I about shat breaks because in that moment I realized I wasn't just being questioned, the other guy was there hiding out of line of sight and silently in case I was who they were looking for and looked to prevent any means of escape, he was drawn. I remembered my waking thoughts of grabbing my wallet, that could have made the last mistake I ever made. About a year and a half ago, I was working security for a POS mini-mart a few blocks from my house. Simple stuff, just keep an eye out for shoplifters and evict the homeless guy that thinks if he doesn't look at you you can't see that he's in the dumpster, again. I'm talking to the night clerk and keeping an eye on the handful of people that are in the store when a woman comes flying in the front door and screams that someone just got hit by a car outside. Part of my super expensive training that I get paid minimum wage for is triage and advanced first aid, so the clerk calls 911 while I run out to the corner to help. When I got there, there was a truck blocking the intersection, and across the side street from my store, there's a body laying in the road. The dude in the truck saw the person get hit, stopped, and was trying to help, but the people that actually hit them split. The guy in the street was a mess. His face was bloody, his head was bleeding, his mouth was full of blood and a few broken teeth, and he was bleeding bad enough from somewhere that it was running into the gutter like a live-action version of the opening to Sweeney Todd. It took us a bit, but we got him to stay still, and stop trying to get up. We stabilized his head, got his name and verified concussion and started the list of injuries, before the fire truck even pulled out of the station two blocks away. We still couldn't find where the majority of the blood was coming from, but we couldn't move him to look, since we were 80% sure he had a spine injury, and he definitely was concussed. EMTs got there, and we relay all the information, and get out of their way so they can do their thing. One of his complaints was that his leg hurt, which was pretty expected since he took a 45 miles per hour minivan. They cut his jeans open, and the entire bottom three quarters of his shin bone was sticking through his leg. You couldn't even tell looking at his pants that anything was wrong. They found the minivan about a block down the street, in a car wash. The driver had ignored the crosswalk flashers, hit the guy crossing, merrily missed an old man in a scooter, and left the young man in the street. They had hit him so hard it threw him through the intersection. It knocked his shoe off. His mom came by the store a few days later to talk to us, and she let us know after some physical therapy and a good bit of time healing, he'd be okay. They reconstructed his leg with pins and rods, and had to plate his fractured skull back together, but he was already recovering well. I'm glad he was alright in the end. I can't cross the street if cars are coming up on me, crosswalk or no. Few weeks later, I was doing my walk around when a car sped up to these two young guys that had just left the store, and a bunch of people jumped out with pipes and beat the ever-loving crap out of them. Threw one of them in the trunk of the car and took off. No idea why. Cops caught up with them a few blocks away, but it was a long time before we saw the two guys in the store again. Night shift in a dormitory for sick and autistic children. Reading Night Shift by Stephen King and thinking this is actually not a good idea, the stories made me nervous in a half-lit corridor full of dark rooms and strange noises. And suddenly? Some strange rattling noise from one of the rooms. I put the book down, there is this nine years old young boy tangled in his sheets and shaking like hell, eyes inward and mouth wide open and, bang. Blackout in the whole building. I hear alarms in the distance, that means electricity went out in the district, too not just the building. And the fear comes in, I reach for my pocket light, get it in my mouth but I feel my teeth making clinging little noises on the metal in shaking so much. So that is how I handled my first epilepsy situation around 2 o'clock. After the kid got calm, I run down the dark stairs, speeding trough a 70 meters long hall with a lamp in my mouth and half screaming for a nurse. I really thought the boy gonna die it was a grand mal, bigger seizure, but I handled the situation well. 
It was four years ago, since then I win the school's tournament in sprint games every year by run the 100 meters distance in 12, 9 seconds. Still not an Olympics time but everybody asks how can I run so fast. Dude, just put a few stairs in and make it full dark I'm still going to make it in 13 seconds. I was a resident safety aide which means I worked the front desk at the dorm and made sure everyone swiped in, signed in guests, etc. I had been working in this position at my old school and recently transferred to a new university. This was my first solo shift at the new school, and I was working either 12 am to 4 am or 4 am to 8 am, I can't remember, I want to say 12 to 4. Either way, it's a Tuesday and it's a quiet shift. My supervisors speak to me beforehand, assure me it'll be quiet and I won't have any problems, and to call them if I need anything. I'm not worried. About an hour or so into the shift, a student with a backpack wanders in. I'm not paying huge attention to who walks in, if they can swipe themselves in, that's not my job. He walks behind me, then comes back and informs me that there's a small fire in a paper holder behind the desk like this. It seems to be smoking. I frown and say okay, and ponder who to call about it, I find a number and start dialing when the guy comes back and says there are now flames. Okay. I call the emergency numbers, I think it was campus police, and the guy is asking me what to do. I am not allowed to leave the desk, seriously, at all. I do leave briefly to run and take a look at the small fire, which is smoldering at this point. I tell him to get a fire extinguisher and have it if he wants to. I get back on the phone with police. The fire is now smoking more severely. A campus PD officer shows up, grabs a fire extinguisher and starts doing her thing. Then, all hell breaks loose. The fire alarm goes off. Smoke is now filling the entire lower floor of the building. The city fire department shows up, two trucks. Students are filing out past the front desk, coughing because there is so much smoke. My hands are shaking so badly that I can't dial my supervisor's number. I finally manage to call him and beg him to come help me, because I don't know what to do. Firefighters in full gear are coming into the building, and the fire, by the way, is directly behind me. I'm supposed to be recording everything in a notebook, but have no idea what I'm supposed to write, I have been briefed in what to do in the event of an emergency, but it was brief, in a you'll never have to do this so don't worry about it way. Finally, a firefighter tells me to leave the desk. I have never run so fast in my life. My adrenaline is completely pumping. The entire residence hall has been evacuated and I was the last student inside. My supervisors are waiting outside. This has never happened before, they have never seen a residence hall evacuate the front desk. However, there are procedures in place and I have to go back inside and retrieve boxes of documents on the residents, including handicapped residents who need to be evacuated from their rooms. I haven't recorded a very good timeline of when officials arrived, partly because my hands are shaking so bad that I can't write. Everyone is understanding and apologetic, because this is unprecedented. I wouldn't have been expected to know what to do in the event of my evacuation because it's never happened before. The fire was put out quickly and never spread far, but the bigger problem was the smoke, as plastic is very smoky. Large fans were brought in to disperse the smoke and eventually residents are allowed back in. The police ask me if I remember who came in, but I don't. I think that someone walked in before the guy with the backpack, but I can't be sure, I provide a vague description. This is 2007 and a very liberal university big on privacy rights so there wasn't security footage. The campus newspaper wrote a report on the incident quoting backpack dude as saying that he alerted the front desk staff but they didn't really seem to know what to do. Of course, the paper didn't ask who I was or interview me, this was my very first shift. The person who set the fire was never caught. I didn't get in any trouble and everyone was apologetic of my terrible first night, 
but I quit two weeks later for a different job where I could get a full night's sleep. TL, DR my first shift in resident safety a dorm caught on fire. I'm A a paramedic that works nights and it takes a lot to get me shook. I've been shot at, full dead kids out of pools, shooting, stabbings you name it. Once we got a call for a medical alarm that had gone off at a deaf lady's house. Rumor had it she hadn't been seven for a few days so you go take a look. Knock on the door, no answer, she's deaf. We go to the side of the house to tap on the window of her bedroom. Yeah, no cause that's where most people are at 3.30 am. We can see shapes through the blinds. Looks a shape like a standing over a person on the bed. We knock on the window and the shape springs at the window and leaves blood on the glass. We move back to the front door work the police and boot that fuck down. We're met with a wall of nine day old animal piss and varmints kept in cages lining the walls. Wheels, skunks, tree cats raccoons, we get to the room this lady was in and she had a hairless badger as a pet dot and when she had a heart attack and died several days before he didn't get fed. So he just started digging into her 40 year old Walmart belly to keep himself fed. That was the first and last time I ever hoped to see a hairless badger. Covered in blood it looks like Satan's monkey butler on steroids. I took a day off after that. Sort of the other way round? I scared a bunch of people at a night shift. I pre-recorded some murmuring and random words like hello, you have made a big mistake etc on my phone. Then I got a Bluetooth speaker and set it in a room. Why? Because we had planned to play he Ouija board. The place I used to work it was nice. The median age of employees was probably 23 and it was about 30 of us all together. All of us were friendly but some of us were mischievous. Pranking each other was a daily routine and often the CEO and COO were involved. They were always involved after the fact when everyone laughed at the poor soul who got pranked on. Anyway. One night somebody suggested we play the Ouija board and I just couldn't pass up this opportunity to fuck with everyone. The Bluetooth speaker was a tiny one. The only problem was that it had blue light which would be visible in a dark room. So I put tape over that. I placed it inside an open box and had my phone connected. I was one of the biggest skeptics of the office so if I could act scared, it would be very convincing. I used an office iPad to record the event and everyone was aware of the recording. We sat down and started, holding hands so I couldn't just take my phone out to play the audio. This is where my genius becomes tangible. I had it set up as 5 minutes of silence before audio started. 5 minutes later, the question on the table was is someone here? And amazingly a voice came saying hello. Everyone freaked out. It was just perfect. Perfect timing. Then the murmurs started. Then a whispering voice saying don't fuck with me followed by more murmurs and then Mark killed me. He kills me. I had to act freaked out. One slip and I would give it all away. And then a co-worker of mine let go of the hands and fell to the floor. He passed out. We turned on the lights and a few seconds later he came too. We gave him water and calmed him down. Seeing the collective scare on my co-workers and brilliant execution, I thought the best way to honor it would be to not tell them what I did. It's been a few years and I'm sure there are five guys out there still telling people how they experienced a real ghost killed by some Mark guy. Lol.